Hey, fellow Mathers, before we get into this episode, we want to share with you how you can get access to free content, professional learning that will keep your students engaged and doing the math that matters. Get ready to go to this link, mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. That's right. Registration is open for the free Math is Figure Outable challenge that's starting May 15th and runs to the 17th at 7 p.m. Central. We're going to have three nights jam-packed with learning and routines that you can take straight to your classroom. In these challenges, we have a great time. We do some math, talk about classroom experiences, give away super cool bonuses and prizes. You won't just walk away with routines that are naturally engaging and encourage your students to think mathematically. You'll also have a chance to win over 6 k worth in prizes, including a few virtual PD sessions for your school. I'll be joined by my wonderful co-host, Kim, and special guest, Jenna Laib. You can register at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge for a fantastic learning experience. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Now on to the show. Hey, fellow mathematicians. Welcome to the podcast where math is figure outable. I'm Pam. And I'm Kim. And you found a place where math is not about memorizing or mimicking, waiting to be told or shown what to do, but it's about making sense of problems, noticing patterns, and reasoning using mathematical relationships. Y'all, we can mentor students to think and reason like mathematicians. Not only are algorithms really not helpful in teaching mathematics, but rotely repeating steps actually keep students from being the mathematicians they can be. All right, Kim, on today's episode, I thought I would tell you, um, we talk a little bit about, uh, I had dinner at CAMPT. So CAMPT is the Conference for the Advancement of Mathematics Teaching. It is the Texas State Conference. It's super good. If you ever get a chance to come to Texas, y'all, come join us in our super state conference. Um, and uh, I sat down with a bunch of folks and Curtis Brown was there. We had some uh, nice chat over dinner. And I didn't know that Curtis Brown and Joni Funderbunk have a podcast and it is called the room to grow a math podcast podcast. <laughs> I put the word podcast in there twice, but a room to grow. No, sorry. Room to grow a math podcast by Curtis and Joni. Yeah, it was great. I've, I've known Curtis for a while. We had a nice chat and everything. And so on my, on my drive home from Fort Worth, I live in Austin. So it's about a three and a half hour drive. I listened to some of their podcast and uh, one of the episodes they did, we thought we'd put our little spin on. So they have we'll, a great rapport. I, yeah, yeah, they you, do. You sent, you sent me an episode to listen to and it was super fun. Yeah, it was, it's yeah. nice. So we are going to talk about um, their episode. I think it was 3.6. Don't lose the mathematics. Mm -hmm. And they talked about kind of nixing the tricks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we thought we'd put our spin a little bit um, and add to that conversation. We would wholeheartedly agree that yeah. um, we should nix the tricks. There's um, a fine booklet out there. It's online. You can get it for free. You can order the book uh, if you want to actually have the hard copy called Nix the Tricks. And Kim, I think you and I would both agree that it does a fine job of identifying some tricks that math yeah. teachers have kind of maybe found over time uh, that 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 unfortunately they're promoting as, as doing math. They're like, yeah. Hey, here's a, here's a trick to do this. Here's a different trick to do that. Yep. And many of us are saying, now nah, let's nix those tricks. Let's, let's, uh, let's actually focus on what mathematicians do the way they think and not teach these tricks. Yeah. Um, and so Curtis and Joni in that um, episode mentioned a few of the, the tricks and came up with some um, some things to think about. Uh, do you want to mention anything else about the, the episode, or then I'll I'll just dive into what I was thinking about? Um, yeah. So there were a couple of things that they talked about that prompted me to revisit the Nix the Tricks uh, website, and mm -hmm. I had forgotten that it was uh, kind of curated. Uh, I can't remember who it was, but a couple of people. But a lot of it was submitted by the math community in general which I absolutely love. And it, and it's like a collection of things. And I got to tell you, Pam, when I got on the website, I was like, wow, there's even more uh, tricks <laughs> than, I mean, like, this is not the kind of thing listeners where we're saying, go check it out and like learn a bunch of new things in your classroom. We would absolutely uh, recommend that you don't go learn some things, but you won't learn them. There's just people telling you like, here's a thing, that, a trick you can, you can do. Um, but yeah, there were several on there that I was like, wow, I've never heard of that before. How is that? There's like 70 different 
It's like, not can math. Imagine being yeah. a middle school kid, and you're like, "Here's one more." Here's Let's one more. try to memorize all of those. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Yeah. Well, which so, is kind of what we get, right? The right. older the students get, the uh, if that's the kind of math class they've been in, and uh, it just gets harder and harder to say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa!" The, yeah. yeah, yeah. You get answers with those tricks, but you can actually think about that stuff. And yeah. You, uh, actually reason through um and using what you know oh let's yeah. see we might have to back up and um know some more things yeah one of the things that that i thought we could kind of add to the conversation a little bit is one of the things they talked about is how do you know if something is a trick or not yes and we thought we'd add a little bit of the conversation uh from piaget so Jean Piaget was uh, well, kind of a Renaissance guy, did a lot of things. But one of the things he did was talk about education and, and learning psychology. And he talks about um, different types of knowledge. And uh, if we could concentrate on two different types of knowledge that pertain to kind of what we're talking about, one of them is social knowledge. And one of them uh, he calls logical mathematical. And I'm just going to call it logical, ma- logical knowledge. Yep. The difference between social knowledge and logical knowledge is social knowledge is by convention. It is the stuff that we have deemed to be so. We have defined it that way. We've, um, we've put a tag on it. It's, it's uh, one way to think of that is if you change languages, someone would have to tell you the new word. Mm-hmm. So it is socially created. Um, it's by convention. It's the kind of stuff we have to tell kids. That's the stuff we need to tell kids. Those are things that I'm kind of okay if you have a mnemonic for, uh, because otherwise you, you t- to, to remember them, it, it could be helpful to have a, a mnemonic to remember that stuff. Mm-hmm. One of the ones that is true uh, that Joni and Curtis mentioned in their podcast was Sokotoa. So Sokotoa is a, is a bunch of letters to help kids remember the way that we've designed trig functions. So we've, we have um, defined trig functions that the sign is the opposite over the hypotenuse. And that's the, so part of it. So uh, we've got uh, S uh, how do I even do that? See, I haven't done this for so long. Sign opposite over hypotenuse, right? So sign a O H. Mm-hmm. So S S O H is the. So of Sokotoa. And then, uh, that's funny because I haven't even actually used Sokotoa to help me do it because I, I just own these so much. So then it would be the definition of cosine and tangent um, would come in there as well. Well, somebody made up the word sine to represent that we could have the the ratio of the opposite over the hypotenuse. Um, the ratio of the opposite to the hypotenuse is the sine. We just made that that word up for sine. We, we could have called it the Kim. Like Kim could have been the ratio of the opposite to the hypotenuse. Um so it, I'm okay that, it, that you, um, I mean, I want you to use it a lot so that it just becomes a part of you, but because somebody made up the word sign and they decided that that one is connected to the ra- ratio of the opposite to the hypotenuse, um, I'm okay that we sort of, well, we have to tell kids that because we just, des- we decided it was going to be that way. So that's an example of something that's social. Mm-hmm. So yeah, go ahead and tell kids, but boy, then to actually use sign we need a lot of experience. That's mm-hmm. a logical relationship. So first of all, since it's a ratio, we need to give kids experience reasoning proportionally. Kids need to be able to reason proportionally about ratios or all they see it is as a, a number over a number. That's positional. They're not going to be able to actually reason about what's happening with that ratio if they don't have some sort of ratio proportional uh, relationships. And then they can't use sine to do all sorts of the sine function to do all sorts of other things. Um, if all they do is memorize Sokotoa, mm-hmm. if, if they just use that mnemonic to memorize it, then we're sort of stuck in this kind of trick area where we're pretending that math is all social. So there's some parts of math that are social, but most of it, the, the the vast majority of the things that we want kids to learn are not social at all. They are that logical type of knowledge. And for that, we want to give kids experience. Right. So with that, we could add to the, the conversation a little bit that if you can look at the thing you're trying to teach and say to yourself, hey, is this, is, is part of this social? Well, then I'm going to tell kids that and, I'm, and mm-hmm. I might help kids wrote, memorize that. But the vast majority of whatever it is, is probably logical, mathematical, then bam, we're jumping in and we're going to actually have experience learning that, that things experience, uh, gaining relationships and making the mental neural connection stronger and stronger. Yeah. I think more and more, thankfully, we're hearing people say, 
uh, these are some tricks. Don't teach kids the tricks. It's not about cutesy. It's not about a bunch of things to memorize. I mean, I, I think we're hopefully trending towards that becoming uh, less and less of a thing. But what I am seeing, I think you're seeing this too, is that instead of those tricks, then what people are doing is just explaining more clearly or maybe explaining things with a little bit more uh, mathematics, but it's still a little bit too much of explaining, right? Like a little too much of teacher has all this knowledge. Let me just tell you. Let me just dump it in your head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is also not something that we advocate, right? We want to build mathematicians by giving them experiences, by uh, posing important questions, letting them wrestle and grasp some stuff, having deep conversations, uh, letting them be a part of the process rather than just standing at the front, telling them with a little bit more meat than some of the tricks we might have done. uh, Yeah, because because we actually believe that's actual learning. Yeah. We don't believe that you can unzip a kid's head and pour some stuff in and then they own it. Mm -hmm. That's like saying, go ask GPT how to, and then, and then pick something that's like, in fact, here's, here's a way that sometimes I determine whether something's logical, mathematical or social. If you can ask Google or chat GPT a question Mm -hmm. and their answer actually, you, you can own it. You can do something with it. You can run with it. Then it's probably social. Like yeah. if it's, if it's enough, if you're like, Hey, when was pick something, when was Mount Rushmore created I, I, it was some random social thing? That's a social thing. It, it mm-hmm. happened. There's no way you can figure that out. Right. Who were the signers of the declaration of independence? Bam. Like I'm going to go, I, I can ask that when I get the answer, it's satisfying. I'm done. But if I say, uh, um, ask Ch- chat GPT, um, all the connections and relationships to build a nuclear bomb, which I don't even think it will answer that question or to, uh, what w- everything about quadratic equations, it might tell me a lot of stuff about quadratic equations, but uh, that telling, I, if I don't have enough to, to uh, experience, to own that stuff, then, uh, then I'm not going to own it. I can't do anything with the answer. So yeah. chat GPT might give me a great answer. But if I don't have experience grappling with those relationships, then I'm not going to own them enough to do something with them. Yeah. Yeah. So some people are saying, don't teach the tricks. We're saying, don't just explain more. Actually yeah. build mathematicians by giving them experience. Yeah. So the other thing that I think uh, is fun to bring up today mm-hmm. is that lot, there are lots of educational leaders out there. And we're so lucky to have a bunch of people doing really good work um, to, to move away from tricks and to do a better job of giving kids these experiences. Um, and so you think that there's a lot of uh, richness to bring to a classroom, but the one that you probably focus on um, a lot more because you love them and because they're so beneficial are problem strings, right? Like yeah, that's, that's kind of a shtick. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of an yeah. important thing, maybe because it's so, it, it, once it becomes routine, it's a quick routine that there's so much meat, like there's, there's so much bang for your buck in a problem string. So you do problem strings. Some people do number talks. Some people do, you know, all these other things. And let's talk for just a second about the idea that when you go all in on a thing, like a problem string or a never talk or whatever, um, there are some really good things about it, but there's also some things to be on guard just about be aware of. Um, because we've, we've, we've both had conversations where people say, well, I do this thing, but when they describe, let's say number talks, they do number talks, but when they describe what they're doing with number talks or how they're uh, sharing number talks in the classroom or what they think they're getting out of number talks. Um, we've heard some scenarios where we feel like people are just kind of like missing the boat a tad bit. Mm -hmm. And the, um, let's talk about the, the kind of the negative to that, like, what, what can happen when people go all in on one thing and that's the only thing that they they focus on? Yeah, and especially if they uh, maybe misunderstand yes. the thing or the purpose yeah. of the thing. or Yeah. Or, yeah. So uh, you mentioned number talks. Let's start there. So are, are number talks great? Absolutely. Yes. Um, but I got to tell you, the first time that I heard the phrase number talks or the title number talks, I, I pushed back on that a lot because yeah. I said to myself, or, or, or maybe even math talks. People are like, oh, you know, yeah, like, let, do a math talk. Mm-hmm. As if that's the only time you talk in math class. Right. Um, and I was like, uh, I want to be talking a lot in math mm-hmm. class, not mm-hmm. just during this one sort of thing that we do. 
So, so a thing to consider is if you've heard math talk or number talk and you're like, oh yeah, that's when we talk in math. I'm going to push back on that and say, right. no, 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 no. We should be talking a lot in math class. Sure. There are times where students are quietly doing their own work. I think that is an appropriate um, use of, of, of math learning time a little bit, but mostly we're having conversations. We're grappling. We're having kids wrestle with, uh, um, we're giving students good problems to tackle so that they uh, can then wrestle and grapple with the relationships. And then we're making that thinking visible and we're pointing at it. But we're doing that not just during a number talk or math talk time. We're doing that all the time. That should yep. be happening during almost all the work that we're doing. So that would be an example of something that you could, um, that maybe we'll, we'll bring up that, that a tweak. A tweak that we would suggest is, um, sure, you can do number talks sometimes in your class, but that doesn't mean that you're not talking in other times mm -hmm, of class. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I'll, I'll mention another one, Kim, that I've been thinking about. Um, I hear sometimes uh, people say, oh, exploding dots is the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. So I think exploding dots, uh, it, it, depending on how you define it, is, is kind of cool. Um, I like to listen to um, James Tan. Thank, thank you, James Tan. <laughs> I can't believe. Whoa, I got I got sleep last night. Um, James Tan is a is a um, uh, enjoyable um, presenter to listen to. Um, he's, he tells good stories. It's pretty funny. However, I would mention that I think Exploding Dots does its best work when we use it to think about place value. Yeah. So how does our pl base 10 place value system work? And so if I have this dot in this place, like say I have one dot in the tens place, bam, it can explode into these 10 ones in the ones place, um, or I can gather uh, 10 tens in the tens place and I can grab those 10 tens and I can stick them into one dot in the hundreds place, or I can explode it back and have 10 tens and that, you know, like whatever. That is a great, um, and it's a fine way to kind of think about our, our base 10 place value system. Uh, but then if you'll consider that, um, other times where he talks about exploding dots or other ways that people have used exploding dots really then is a way to understand the traditional algorithms. Well, if your goal is to understand the traditional algorithms, okay, then right, go ahead. Yeah, use exploding dots to help you understand them. But if you've listened to the podcast very long at all, you know that, that mimicking those traditional algorithms or even understanding those traditional algorithms is not really our goal. We want kids to solve problems fluently and, uh, and, and do that as they build their brains to reason mathematically. That's our goal in a math classroom. So we're not really, it, it, it's not a big goal to understand the algorithm. So we kind of de-emphasize exploding dots um, in the work that we do. So some people have asked me, why don't you, why don't you use exploding dots more? I'm like, I mean, they're fine for yeah. understanding place value, but for doing anything else, not my goal. So I, again, I'm not, I'm not denigrating. I'm not saying that they're bad in any way. It's just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in all in on them. Yeah. What were you going to say? Um, I was going to say, do you remember one time we were interviewing some students and we had a young lady who uh, gave her a problem mm -hmm. and it was a, a not super complicated problem for maybe her age. Uh, and we had seen her do some work where we knew this problem was not likely to be a super challenging problem for her. She had done some other, some other things that mm -hmm. were maybe a little bit more complicated, but because she had been using exploding dots so much uh, she did that for every problem. And I don't, you know, I don't pretend to know. Uh, well, did that, did that. Let me, let me describe what she did. So it was like a problem, like seven plus eight or something. Yeah. And she dutifully wrote down seven yep. dots and dutifully yep. wrote down eight dots and then, and then moved her yep. paper over and then like circled seven plus three and said, okay, no, that's one 10. And then what's yep. left over. And then she's like, okay, that's, so that's 15. Yep. And I looked at her and I was like, do you know, seven plus eight? I think, man, I, were you interviewing her? Both yeah. of us were there, yeah. I remember. And she's like, oh yeah, it's 15. And yeah. we were like, like, but did you have to do all that work? No, 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 but that's what I'm supposed to do. Right. <laughs> but I think that's the point, right? That's the point is that I don't know what James Stanton's take would be on that. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. there are things. And so her experience with either her teacher or previous teachers or whatever was that this is what you do. And so what a thing that is maybe a really good idea, maybe exploding dots is fantastic for a place value or whatever, but what we see happening is these really good things turn into do the same thing all the time, or this is how the one way that you use them. And so I think that's the, that's the challenge, right? Is hearing something and going like, what 
in what way do I want to use this idea that somebody's sharing about and and have it not go awry? Not, right. And how, when would I not use it? And mm-hmm. how how is it not helping my students in these particular instances? Um, can I bring up another one? Yeah, sure. Or do you want to talk about that? Okay. Um, you get asked a lot, uh, what about manipulatives? And it's kind of an interesting question because people will say, what about manipulatives? Question mark. And it's like, mm-hmm. wait, what, what's the question there? What? Yeah, what manipul- about manipulatives? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, how, like, when, say more. which one? Uh-huh. uh-huh. So yeah, yeah. It's, it, you'll need a long answer, but in, in brief. Well, mm-hmm. So I, I have to tell you, the first thing that comes to mind is Gail Burrell was uh, a former NCTM uh, president. Yeah. And when I was a young teacher, she was the NCTM president and she did a president's message. And it was when the Wendy's commercials, I'm totally dating myself here. The Wendy's commercials had come out. Where's the beef? Where's yeah. the beef? Where's the, and their, their whole thing was, you know, we have, we have big hamburgers, I guess. And, but where's the beef and every, in, uh, everywhere else. But her thing was, where's the math? Yeah. And she said, as she was traveling around as the NCTM president, she saw a lot of manipulatives out yeah. in classrooms and she, her concern was, where's the math? Yeah. And so I share that concern. Um, yep. And here's where I would add to that conversation. Uh, we do a lot of talking about developing mathematical reasoning in that we need kids to learn to count and solve problems using counting strategies. But then we want to advocate additive reasoning and, yeah. and thinking in terms of bigger chunks of numbers. If we give kids one-to-one manipulatives all the time, Kids will have uh, will not necessarily be nudged, be encouraged to mm-hmm. to build their brains to think in terms of chunks of numbers because they're counting one by ones. If we give them one to one manipulatives, they will continue to count one by one. Right. So the biggest caution that I would give, it's not the only one, but the biggest caution I would give about manipulatives is um, to think about what is my goal here and is the manipulative supporting answer getting only or is it supporting the goal of building reasoning and what kind of reasoning so then we actually have to identify what kind of reasoning we're trying to build i'll give you a quick example early early when i dove into elementary so i was secondary teacher i got super interested in elementary i started diving into research one of the things i did was volunteer in my kids school and one day they said hey today Today, we're not going to give you that group of kids you've been kind of extending. I had had a group of kids and I was just experimenting and trying some things um, with them. And they said, today, we, we don't have time for you to do that. Sorry, we didn't you know tell you ahead of time. But today, can you just help this one student? She's just really struggling. And I was like, oh, I don't even know what I will do with the <laughs> second grade student, but sure. And so I started chatting with a student and they said, help her add. And it was like add two digit numbers. And they gave me base 10 materials. Yeah. And so uh, I, I wasn't even sure what to do with base. And so I said to her, you know, I, we got this problem, 28 plus 37, like, what are you going to do? And she goes, well, I think I'm supposed to grab these rods. Mm-hmm. And I, and I said, what, what's a rod? Cause like, this is me early. Right. I'm like, I don't even know what a rod is. She goes, well, you know, it's this thing right here. And I said, well, what is this? Expecting her to say it's 10. And she goes, it's a rod. And I said, right. But you know, like if, if, if this is one, what's this? And she goes, it's a rod. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I, now you might be like, well, Pam, that student misunderstood or whatever. But when I pulled out the hundred and she said, that's a flat. And she goes, I think it's called a flat. And I was like, um, but like how many of these little guys are in that? She goes, I don't know. I'm like, well, how many of these little ones are in this 10? And she, I, I think I literally said, how many of these ones are in this 10? And she goes, it's a rod. And I'm like, right. Yeah. But how, yeah. so then she, then she took the little one and she lined it up against the rod to see. And she goes, well, I guess in this one, there's 10. So, yeah. yeah, So my point is that uh, I'm not sure what the teacher had tried to do. Obviously, you could do a better job of that. But in manipulatives, we have supposed we've created. How do I say this? We've created manipulatives to represent the mathematics that we have created in our minds Mm -hmm. and supposed that students can see the mathematics in that manipulative. And that is not true. Students right. cannot just look at this pre-constructed rod that we've stuck together and all of a sudden go, oh yeah, that's a 10 and see there's 10 of those in that flat and right. there's 10 of those in that cube. And, and it, so we can't, we can't, I'm, I'm going maybe longer than you wanted me to, but we can't just assume that, that because we've created the relationships and we now know what the, what the mathematics that are involved in that manipulative, that then therefore it woo, magically appears to the students. Yeah. Um, in the manipulative. So yeah. I don't, 
Yeah. There's, I, I, there's four other things I can think about manipulatives, but we're, we won't make this too, too long. Ago. Yeah. Well, I don't know how, how long uh, we want to go, but I, I think the, the big recap, the, the point here mm-hmm. is that our manipulatives or number talks or exploding dots, uh, are they, are they bad? Absolutely not. There's value in, in all of those and many more other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's important to keep in mind is that if, if you think only doing that thing is going to get you very far. We have to use manipulatives for everything. They yeah. have to oh, always yeah. be out and we have to always have kids using it. Yep. If kids don't have manipulatives in their hand, you're doing a bad job teaching. Right. Mm, we're saying no, no, yeah, not that. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry um, to interrupt. And that's okay. And also, um, you know, there are, are ways that these things are being used that miss the mark of even the people who um, are sharing about them. Mm-hmm. Right. So like mm-hmm. just, just recently we talked about problem strings and how, you know, we think we're being super clear about them and, and yet there's still questions. And so I love when people continue to ask, right? Like what's the value in this and how often should I be using it? And in what way should I be using it? And how do I know if they're being effective? Yeah. And you know that you're on the best journey possible when you continue to ask Mm -hmm. those questions. And we all continue to get better at at refining what is the best way to use each of these individual things. What are ways that we want to de-emphasize and and how are we using them so that we can get the best mileage, not just getting answers, but actually creating mathematicians in our classrooms. Yeah. Nice. Cool. So we can't possibly talk about all of that here. We are going to mention, no mention, we're going to dive in and do some really good work with these kinds of things and more of them where the, like, it's a good, super good thing, but let's really uh, get more, uh, let's clarify how best to use and maybe how not to use. We're going to do more of that in the free challenge that's coming up very soon. We have a free challenge coming up. It is um, August. Oh golly, Kim, I don't have the date handy. Mm. This is August something. I've almost got it. I've almost got it. <laughs> this it's 2023. So if you're listening right now, we have a challenge coming up August 23rd through the 25th of 2023. But y'all, if you're listening to the podcast at some other time, um, and, and it's not that time for the challenge, we run challenges. And so the best thing you can do is make sure that you get on our email list. So you'll know what we are doing coming up free to continue to clarify. One thing that's really awesome about the challenges is unlike this podcast, they're visual. So you can yeah. see what we're doing. Uh, we get to interact. Uh, it's super fun. We like to, we love to have people join us um, in the challenge. So definitely join our email list, go to math is There'll be a pop-up. You can uh, get on the email list and make sure that way you can hear what is coming up as we continue to all help each other refine what we're doing in our math classrooms. So y'all, thanks for tuning in and teaching more and more real math. To find out more about the Math is Figure Outable movement, visit mathisfigureoutable.com. Let's keep spreading the word that math is figure outable. Thank you for listening and making math more figure outable. To learn even more, make sure you register for our free challenge at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. You are not going to want to miss the evenings of May 15th through 17th, starting at 7 p.m. Central. Math teaching, math teaching, go register now. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Join us to make math more and more figure outable. And if you can't join live, register and we'll send you access to the recordings. We'll see you there.